Since the Eastern, quote, Orthodox reject the papacy, they consider all bishops to have equal authority. They believe some bishops have a special place or honor in terms of ecclesiastical organization, but they hold all bishops to be ultimately equal in terms of authority and, quote, divine right. As Eastern Orthodox Metropolitan Bishop Timothy Ware stated in his book The Orthodox Church, which is sometimes used as an Orthodox catechism, quote, Since the schism between East and West, he, that is the, quote, Patriarch of Constantinople, has enjoyed a special position of honor among all the Orthodox communities. But he does not have the right to interfere in the internal affairs of other churches, end quote. He also stated, quote, The system of patriarchs and metropolitans is a matter of ecclesiastical organization. But if we look at the church from the viewpoint not of ecclesiastical order but of divine right, then we must say that all bishops are essentially equal. The system of pentarchy does not impair the essential equality of all bishops, end quote. Their position contradicts Christ's establishment of the papacy on St. Peter, in which Christ gave St. Peter and his successors a primacy of jurisdiction over the entire flock of Christ, as scripture clearly proves. See Matthew 16, 18-19 and John 21, 15-17. The Eastern, quote, Orthodox, inconsistent ecclesiology serves as another refutation of their religion. It renders them unable to resolve where the territory or jurisdiction of one bishop begins and another bishop ends. This problem was on display recently with a major and historic break in communion between the Russian Orthodox sect and the Greek Orthodox sect. They have no consistent way of resolving the dispute over Ukrainian, quote, clerics because they hold that all bishops have equal authority. The Russian Orthodox Church has broken ties with the leader of the worldwide Orthodox community. The fight is being compared to the greatest Orthodox split since the schism with Catholicism in 1054. Why? The worldwide leader, ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew I, last week granted Ukrainian clerics their independence from Moscow. They had been under Russian leadership since the 1600s. Russia's Metropolitan Hilarion calls the decision, quote, lawless and canonically void and says it might lead to a deep religious rift in Ukraine. Joining me now is Metropolitan Jonah Puffhausen, former Archbishop of Washington, primate of the Orthodox Church in America, now serving in the jurisdiction, the Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia. Metropolitan Jonah, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. What does this mean? Basically, what it means is that there is a break in communion. There's not a full split, but there's a break in communion between the Russian Orthodox Church and the Church of Constantinople. And what does that mean for the faithful? Well, what it means in Russia is something that very different than what it means in America. In Russia, it means that uh, Russians on vacation in Turkey can't go to church and receive communion. Um, in the United States, it means that uh, people, members of the Russian Orthodox Church and members of the Greek Orthodox Church aren't supposed to go to church together. Было принято решение о полном разрыве евхаристического общения с Константинопольским патриархатом. Это было вынужденное решение, но иного решения не мог принять наш священный синод, поскольку к этому вела вся логика последних действий Константинопольского патриархата. К эти беззаконные и антиканоничные решения с точки зрения Константинополя остаются в силе, мы не сможем находиться в общении с этой церковью, оказавшейся сегодня в расколе. Their false and unbiblical ecclesiology also renders them unable to consistently differentiate true and binding ecumenical councils from false ones, since many false councils in church history were approved by many bishops. If all bishops have equal authority, why are some councils that were approved by bishops considered to be infallible and binding while others are not? They have no consistent answer to that question. In fact, here is Eastern Orthodox Bishop Timothy Ware explaining why they can't determine whether a council is ecumenical based on the number of bishops. Another second possible criterion of ecumenicity is confirmation by a subsequent ecumenical council. But that won't help us because there will always be one ecumenical council, the most recent in the series, that has not yet been confirmed by any subsequent council. A third criterion might be the number of bishops present. 
but that won't work either. At Nicaea I, traditionally, there were 318 bishops present. Probably the actual number was about 220. At Constantinople I, there were 150 bishops. At the Council of Ephesus, 431, there were 160 bishops. All three are far smaller than the Arian or semi-Arian council of Ariminum Seleucia in 359, which was attended by some 500 bishops, but is rejected. Or again, the heretical iconoclast council of Hieria in 754 was attended by 338 bishops. So ecumenicity cannot be determined by counting heads. However, with regard to ecumenical councils, many Eastern Orthodox will mention that participation in and or acceptance of a council by the five patriarchal sees, that is Rome, Constantinople, Alexandria, Antioch, and Jerusalem, is something that's important in considering whether a council is ecumenical and therefore binding and infallible in its decrees on faith. This is associated with what is called the doctrine of pentarchy. As Eastern Orthodox theologian John Meyendorf noted about pentarchy, quote, it became an important factor in the Byzantine understanding of an ecumenical council, which required the presence of the five patriarchs or their representatives, even as the eastern seas of Alexandria and Antioch had, in fact, ceased to be influential, end quote. Well, consider this. The Council of Florence in the 15th century was a major reunion council that reconciled many in the East to the Church. The July 6, 1439 Bull of Union with the Greeks at the Council of Florence, which taught the Filioque and the papal primacy of jurisdiction, was endorsed and accepted by representatives of all five patriarchal sees. The Patriarch of Constantinople named Joseph II was present at the Council of Florence. He was in favor of union with the Pope and the Catholic Church, and he died during the Council. Before his death, he wrote a statement affirming that he submitted to the teaching of the Pope and the Catholic Church. Florence's Bull of Union with the Greeks was also approved by his successors as Patriarch of Constantinople, that is, Metrophanes II and Gregory III. Further, at Florence, the deacons of the main church in Constantinople, who served as a kind of council of the Patriarch, signed the Bull of Union. Florence's bull was also accepted by representatives of the men they considered to be the patriarchs of Alexandria, Antioch, and Jerusalem. The Pope, the Bishop of Rome, of course, accepted it. The bull was also accepted by Isidore of Kiev, the Metropolitan of Russia, who also served as a procurator of the Patriarch of Antioch. Isidore came to accept the filioque and the papacy at Florence, and he became a strong supporter of the Union. Among many others, the bull was also accepted by the Byzantine emperor at the time, John VIII, similar to how emperors played a role in organizing early councils. In fact, the bull of union with the Greeks was signed by the entire Greek delegation with the exception of Mark of Ephesus. The refusal of that one bishop to accept an ecumenical council has no bearing on whether the council is ecumenical. If it did, then the first seven councils, which are considered by the Eastern Orthodox to be ecumenical, would not all in fact be ecumenical, since they were not all accepted by all bishops. As an example, two bishops who were present at the Council of Nicaea refused to sign and accept its decree. Let us note that at the seven ecumenical councils, the decisions were never reached by consensus. There was always a dissident minority, small but significant, that rejected the resolutions. So applying their own criteria, there is absolutely no basis for the Eastern Orthodox to reject the Council of Florence's July 1439 Bull of Union with the Greeks as the act of a true ecumenical council. To reject it as ecumenical would logically force them to hold that there has never been a true ecumenical council in church history. As non-Catholic historian Sergei Desniuk stated about the Council of Florence, quote, Greeks had to admit that the necessary conditions for the Council to be truly ecumenical were met. It was held according to the doctrine of Pentarchy, and the Byzantine Emperor was present, end quote. The Byzantine Emperor at the time, John VIII, also stated, quote, I view this holy and ecumenical Council to be no less than any earlier one, end quote. The Reunion Council of Ferrara, Florence, 1438 to 39, certainly thought of itself as ecumenical.
Even Mark of Ephesus, the obstinate heretic and lone member of the Greek delegation who refused to sign the Bull of Union, acknowledged, while at Florence, that the council was truly ecumenical. Joseph Gill is arguably the preeminent historian of the Council of Florence. He pointed out that during a meeting with the Pope and some others at Florence, quote, he, Mark of Ephesus, began by declaring that the present gathering was an ecumenical council since the Pope and his church were present to represent the West, while from the East there was the Emperor, the Patriarch of Constantinople, procurators of the other patriarchates, and the better part of the Oriental Church, end quote. Therefore, according to their own standards, the Eastern Court Orthodox would have to accept Florence's July 1439 Bull of Union with the Greeks as the infallible act of an ecumenical council and its teaching as the voice of the true Church of Christ. In the July 1439 Bull, the Filioque and the Pope's supreme jurisdiction over the Church were proclaimed as truths of the faith. So, if you are Eastern Orthodox and you think that the Filioque and Papal primacy of jurisdiction are false doctrines, then logically, according to your principles, you would have to conclude that your, quote, church defected from the true faith at the Council of Florence in 1439 by accepting the filioque and the papal primacy. Here's what Eastern, quote, Orthodox Metropolitan Bishop Timothy Ware acknowledges in his book, quote, A second reunion council was held at Florence in 1438 to 1439. The Emperor John VIII attended in person, together with the Patriarch of Constantinople and a large delegation from the Byzantine Church, as well as representatives from the other Orthodox churches. A formula of union was drawn up, covering the filioque, purgatory, azymes, and the papal claims and this was signed by all the Orthodox present at the Council except one. Thus, in matters of doctrine, the Orthodox accepted the papal claims, they accepted the doctrine of the procession of the Holy Spirit, they accepted the Roman teaching on purgatory, end quote. In his providence, God allowed Florence to be so well represented, and for the July 1439 bull to fulfill the Eastern Orthodox own criteria for what is an ecumenical council, to give those in the East another and perhaps final chance to recognize the true faith of Christ and submit to the true church's authority. It was a true ecumenical council of the Church of Christ. At Florence, the five C's of what they considered to be the Pentarchy providentially accepted the true faith. After the council, there were even celebrations of the Union in a number of areas. Yet when many went home after Florence's decree had been signed, they were met with fierce resistance in various places, and the Union did not achieve the lasting effects that were hoped for. The fact that Florence's Bull of Union with the Greeks, which teaches the Filioque and affirms a Pope's primacy of jurisdiction, fulfills the Eastern Orthodox' own criteria for an ecumenical council, proves once again that Eastern Orthodoxy is a false religion and that Catholicism is the true faith of Christ. For the Orthodox to reject Florence's bull is to reject the teaching of an ecumenical council, which they claim to believe is infallible. They are refuted by their own principles. In the face of such facts, some adherents of Eastern Orthodoxy might have recourse to the reception theory. This is a view of ecumenical councils that was promoted by an Eastern Orthodox theologian in the 19th century. Since they realize that they cannot determine whether a council is ecumenical based on any objective standard they are willing to accept, such as on the number of bishops or the geographical distribution of bishops, etc., adherents of the reception theory claim that a council can only be considered ecumenical if it was, quote, received by the consciousness of the faithful or the body of the whole church. Of course, they are unable to define what it means to be received by the consciousness of the faithful or the body of the whole church. As should be obvious, the reception theory is fallacious and heretical. First, the first seven councils, which they consider to be ecumenical, were not received by all of those who purported to be part of the church. That by itself refutes the reception theory. Second, the reception theory has the effect of denying the authority that Christ gave to the church to teach in his name in a binding and infallible fashion at specific times in a manner that would demand the assent of the faithful. For according to the reception theory, when a council proclaims something, even with an anathema, it is not to be considered binding or necessarily true until at a later date, perhaps decades or a century later, an undefined group of people choose to receive it. And there's no specific time limit for this recognition. There may be a more or less prolonged period of uncertainty. The reception theory would thus, in practice, subject the pronouncements of every council to an undefined group of people, including laypeople. That would nullify and render meaningless the very authority that Christ gave to the authorities in the church to teach the faithful in a way that demands their assent. The reception theory is clearly heretical. Besides the obvious fatal flaws in the reception theory that we've covered, there is also no support for the idea in the teaching of any ecumenical council. 
There is no doctrinal decree. There is no canon which refers to this act of subsequent reception. No specific statement can be found by participants at any ecumenical council to the effect that they expected their decisions to be confirmed by subsequent reception on the part of the church at large. Hence, there must be and there is an objective standard by which the faithful can recognize that the church is teaching with the authority of Christ. Catholics know this is connected to the papal office, but no matter how the Eastern Orthodox try to explain it with regard to ecumenical councils, such as whether they bring up the Pentarchy or something else, they cannot be consistent and reject that Florence was an ecumenical council. Indeed, another example of how the East agreed to the decree of Florence is found in what happened on December 12, 1452. On that day, Florence's decree of union, which had previously been signed, was proclaimed during a liturgy in Constantinople's main church, Hagia Sophia, in the presence of the emperor, many priests, and many people. During that liturgy, the pope and the pro-union patriarch of Constantinople were prayed for. Nevertheless, although the union was signed and finalized at Florence, there was throughout this period a resistance among many of the people in Constantinople and in other places in the East. It became so intense that at times the pro-union patriarchs of Constantinople had to absent themselves from their home church, Hagia Sophia. Many of the people in the East and in Constantinople were in rebellion against what the universal church under the Pope had formally proclaimed at Florence. This rebellion among the people, this resistance to the act of the Church of God, is why God allowed Constantinople to fall under the darkness of Islamic domination not long after this resistance was manifested. Hence, it's not just a coincidence in our view that after so many in the East rebelled against the union that was achieved and proclaimed at Florence, a union that was formally endorsed by representatives from all five patriarchal sees of what they considered to be the Pentarchy, a short time later God allowed the main ecclesiastical center of power in the East, Constantinople, to fall to the Muslims and under the dominion of Islam. After the fall of Constantinople in the 15th century, the demonic Islamic sultan put severe restrictions on the Greek schismatics in the area. Quote, the church in Constantinople was allowed to undertake no missionary work, and it was a crime to convert a Muslim to the Christian faith. End quote. It was the punishment for their rebellion. The schismatic Greeks were now a sect controlled by the infidels, similar to how the schismatic Russian Orthodox Church was often controlled by the communists in the 20th century. It's also very interesting that after the Muslims took Constantinople, they decided who could serve as, quote, Patriarch of Constantinople for the schismatic sect there. They chose George Scalarius. Scalarius was one of the most important representatives of the Greek delegation at the Council of Florence. At the Council of Florence, Scalarius became convinced of the Catholic position on the filioque and the papal primacy of jurisdiction. He signed the Bull of Union, and he acknowledged that Florence was a true ecumenical council. Quote, he, that is George Scalarius, while at Florence, produced his exhortation and his two treatises in favor of union, and gave a vote in which he clearly stated both that he accepted the council as ecumenical, and that he regarded the Latin doctrine as theologically sound, end quote. However, sometime after the council, falling prey to the deathbed plea of Mark of Ephesus, Scalarius fell into heresy. It was therefore fitting that after the Muslims took Constantinople, the infidels chose an unholy unbeliever like Scalarius to be the pseudo-patriarch of Constantinople for the Greek schismatic sect in the area. In Christian history, all of the major patriarchal sees that the Eastern Orthodox considered to be part of the Pentarchy, but which rebelled against the papacy, that is, Alexandria, Antioch, Jerusalem, and Constantinople, eventually fell under the yoke of Islam. Is that just a coincidence? No. It was a punishment for their separation from the true church and for their rejection of the papacy, which Christ established upon St. Peter. In God's providence, he allowed the other four cities to fall to Islam, with the city of Rome being spared at least until the final days, to manifest that Peter's chair in Rome throughout church history enjoyed a unique authority and a special protection that was not shared by the other sees. Quote, by the time of the Council of Florence, the patriarchates of Alexandria, Jerusalem, and Antioch lost their influence and were on the edge of extinction due to the Islamic factor, end quote. Indeed, it's fascinating that the fall of Constantinople to the Muslims occurred on May 29, 1453, the Feast of Pentecost, the very feast meant to commemorate the coming of the Holy Spirit. Do you think that's just a coincidence? Well, it's not. 
God allowed Constantinople to fall to the Muslims on the Feast of the Holy Spirit as a sign against and as a punishment for the people's resistance to the Filioque, the true doctrine of the Church of Christ on the Holy Spirit, and their resistance to other truths that were formally proclaimed at a council that must be considered ecumenical, even according to their own standards. Quote, then came Muhammad the Conqueror, and Constantinople passed into the hands of the Turk. It was during the Feast of Pentecost on May 29th of 1453 that Constantinople fell before the sword of Othman. End quote. 